inspiring um, grassroots businesses to start from seemingly tiny beginnings. Yeah, it's super cool. It's, what yeah. a great thing to get to do that for a bunch of athletes. And yeah, Absolutely. it's very impressive. All right. Wonderful, you two. You've been fantastic. Thank you, Michelle Langston. Thank you, Chris Finlayson. <laughs> Thank you very appreciate, much. Appreciate your time. I'm Willis Chapman. I'm back tomorrow, Tuesday, 3.45. Till then. This is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Air Haere Akine. Keep your bags packed. Residents in sodden parts of Canterbury are warned there could be more evacuation orders to come. Several highways are blocked, multiple bridges are down, farms flooded, communities cut off. We'll have the latest. National MP Nick Smith's retiring quick smart for personal reasons. And there's also an investigation underway into a verbal altercation in his Wellington office. Waka Kotahi is told to put the pedal down when it comes to getting a cycleway over Auckland's Harbour Bridge. Another 11 community COVID cases in Melbourne. Now it's been passed to rest home residents. And the airline offering a mega incentive to get a COVID jab. Don't forget, you can watch us live on Facebook. RNZ News at 5. Kia ora ko Susana Leata with DNA. Ashburton residents may need to keep their overnight bags packed for a few days until the threat of flooding has passed. The heavy rain has eased in the Ashburton district, but its Mayor Neil Brown says residents remain on standby in case the town's stop banks are breached. We're through the worst of it rain-wise, but there's still a lot of water coming down. It's going to take a wee while to clear the catchment. So it could be another two or three days before it drops right back to reasonable levels. Neil Brown says people are still being advised not to travel. Residents in parts of Christchurch and North Canterbury remain on high alert. Forecasts suggest the rain banned over the Canterbury region is likely to continue to bring steady rain until about 7pm tonight, with showers likely overnight. Alicia Foon reports. Residents of low-lying areas of the Pines Beach in the Waimakariri district were ordered to evacuate this morning, with river levels threatening high homes. The Waimakariri Mayor Dan Gordon says flooding in the region is unprecedented. He says residents who need support should go to an evacuation centre. Christchurch appears to have avoided the worst of the rain, but some streets are closed by flooding and a small sinkhole has developed in the central city. Parts of Akaroa Township are experiencing severe flooding, which appears to be caused by blocked pipes. Australia and New Zealand have wrapped up their formal talks in Queenstown, presenting a united front on China. Both Jacinda Ardern and Scott Morrison strongly pushed back on suggestions New Zealand has sold out. Our political editor Jane Patterson was there. Next story, National MP Nick Smith will leave politics after more than 30 years following a verbal altercation in his Wellington office. In a statement, Mr Smith says he's retiring for personal and professional reasons, including a current parliamentary service inquiry into an employment matter. Mr Smith says an investigation into a verbal altercation that happened last July is still ongoing. He says details of that inquiry have been leaked to the media and it's inappropriate for employment disputes to be litigated in public. Public. Mr Smith says he regrets the incident and has apologised, but the best course of action is for him to resign. He says he had already decided he was going to retire this year after losing the Nelson seat. The only question was when. Mr Smith will leave Parliament on June the 10th. Victoria has now recorded 11 new infections in the last day. A COVID cluster in a Melbourne aged care home has grown to three cases after a second staff member was tested positive for COVID-19. Acting Premier James James Molino says the next few days are critical and the outbreak may get worse before it gets better. Most patients identified as having their personal information hacked at the Waikato DHB nearly two weeks ago have been contacted by the health board. Its entire IT system has been offline since a ransomware cyber attack from overseas nearly two weeks ago. The chief executive Kevin Snee says people being contacted by the DHB are cautious who then said um, they're not sure whether you're, uh, you're scamming us, so they've, they've then called us back and, uh, and we've, um, we've been able to confirm this is actually the hospital content. So the people are obviously al- alert.
Kevin Snee says a helpline has received 24 calls over the last five days. It's three and a half minutes past five. Scott Dixon has slipped to second in the IndyCar Championship after finishing another luckless Indianapolis 500. The pole sitter has finished 17th after falling down the pack when he ran out of fuel on lap 36 and struggled to restart his car. I think the frustrating part was that it just came so early. You know, you knew kind of from that point once you're a lap down, you know, your day's pretty much shot. So I had a long time to calm down. I had a lot of laps to kind of just cruise around. Dixon is now 36 points behind his Chip Ganassi teammate Alex Palo in the championship standings. Palo finished second behind one of Brazilian Helio Castro Neves, who won his fourth Indy 500. Competition leaders, the Northern Stars, are anticipating a much closer contest against the Tactics tonight than the 14-goal win they enjoyed last month in Auckland. The Stars' five-game winning run came to an end last week when they were beaten by the Pulse, while the Tactics have won their last three games on the trot and are looking to turn around the 57-43 loss they suffered in Round 2. Warriors rising star Reese Walsh has missed out on selection in the Queensland State of Origin Rugby League side. Queensland greats Wally Lewis and Billy Moore had urged the selectors to go with the 18-year-old Walsh, who has been a revelation in the six games he has played for the Warriors. New Zealand surfer Paige Herib has made a strong start to her last-ditch bid to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics by winning her opening heat at the World Surfing, Ch- Surfing Games in El Salvador. National champion Safi Vetti has also progressed to the next round. That's the news. A flood like no other. It's an extraordinary scene. It's bank to bank, um, the Ashburton River. Just a raging brown torrent. Bracing for the worst. My fear is laneways, dairy sheds. I'm probably more worried about the farm than I have, to be honest. And lending a hand. We're good at taking care of each other. We've done it many times before. Your calm in the storm. Morning Report, weekdays from 6 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Red warning remains in force for Canterbury until this evening. Northland, Auckland and Coromandel showers, some heavy, easing and clearing Auckland and Coromandel tomorrow morning. Waikato to Taranaki, also Bay of Plenty and Central High Country. Cloudy periods, a few showers for Taranaki, possibly heavy, becoming fine tomorrow. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, isolated showers becoming widespread for a time tomorrow morning, then retreating to the coast. Whanganui to Wellington, also wider Upper and Marlborough. Periods of rain, easing to a few showers tomorrow morning, clearing to fine weather by the evening. Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, a few showers in Nelson and Buller, clearing and becoming fine everywhere tonight. Cloud developing tomorrow with drizzle south of the glaciers. For Canterbury, rain with heavy falls easing this evening, showers tomorrow, gradually clearing and becoming fine. Otago and Southland, a few showers, clearing tomorrow and becoming fine. And Chatham Islands, a few showers. RNC National, it's six and a half minutes past five. Thanks, Susanna. Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai ki checkpoint e tēnei rā, ko Lisa Owen tēnei. The only way out of Ashburton to the north tonight is by air as floodwaters inundate roads around town and locals are urged to hunker down. The options to the south aren't much better with 10 state highways in Canterbury closed. While the Ashburton River has receded a bit, people are being told to keep their bags packed because the call to evacuate could still come. Our reporter Louise Tanuth and cameraman Nathan McKinnon have this report. A reprieve from the rain, but the risk isn't over in Ashburton. The river is still full and there's still pressure on there. We still haven't taken off the notice for the residents to um, for them having their bags packed, ready to go at short notice, so that is still in, uh, in order there for them. Mayor Neil Brown says the river's dropping slowly, but at 1,250 cubic metres, it's still far higher than its usual 10. Not confident that it won't do it. It could still do it. We're still watching that very, very carefully because the flow is still very high. It could take a day or two for that to drop back to a level where we can remove that um, threat of flooding. Farmers are among the worst affected and support is on offer. We've got real support trusters in our operations room next door and they are fielding phone calls from farmers who need assistance. We have one area of farmers which is worst hit, which is in the Green Street area, and um, they're being supported. And I've heard of helicopters flying some feed in for some that uh, cannot drive to get feed into their stock. 
Brian Beeston's one of the dairy farmers in that worst hit area. He says the flooding took hold faster than anticipated. When we knew there was going to be a heavy rain, we didn't expect in the first 12 hours to get what we got because we thought it'd be daylight, we see how much rain's coming, what's happening, we move the cattle. And the block we, had, well, we lost 60 hectares of had grazing for 300 yearlings. All of a sudden, you know, within 12 hours, gone. The whole block gone and the heifers are gone. And at the moment, we've seen odd little groups around on neighbouring properties. He says the big focus is on finding missing animals. But until the water goes down, you can't even get animals because there's, there's, there's rivers where we're, we're paddocks. And so until those rivers go down, you can't even get there with anything safely. So at the moment, is we're hoping these animals are all set ground and neighbours. Brian has one word to describe the last two days. And it's just been chaos and uh, there's nothing we can do until it like now it stopped raining thank god it stopped raining okay so now we just have to let the water run its course and that could be the next 12 hours or 24 hours back in ashburton township local residents that can still safely stay home are hunkering down rex bennett's lived in ashburton for 40 years he says he's never seen rain like this before this would be the most rain i've uh, i've ever seen here yes it has been uh, been constant He's been checking the stock banks over the last 48 hours and feels safe for now. But they're still on standby and had to act quickly on Sunday. I moved a couple of horses on Sunday afternoon. Um, I wasn't concerned but my uh, younger family were and uh, I, uh, um, I wanted to allay the affairs. But, uh, and and we had, our, we had uh, bags pa packed with a bit of stuff and whatnot as in preparation. A short drive away, Haka Tere Marais turned into an evacuation centre. Chair Michelle Brett says since they've opened, they've had more and more people turning up. Well, when I arrived here last night, there was about 25. Um, and then overnight, there was probably about 16, 17 that stayed. And, there, and then there was... Um, and then today we've had another group come through that um, couldn't, that are heading south and can't get across the roads as well. So the main thing at the moment is just wait and see what happens with our roads and if they open up and people can start heading home. 17-year-old Charlotte Nicholl got stuck whilst driving home from Christchurch to Waimati. She's sheltering at the Marae until she can get back on the road. Oh, well and truly, oh, I was a bit nervous that I'd just be like sitting in a cold room but they've like welcomed us, kept us fed, kept us warm, been ever so like kind. I can't imagine being on my own and not having this place. But people like Kylie Rose Paul are making sure she and others staying there are well fed. I'm just preparing uh, macaroni and cheese for whoever gets stranded really. They're prepared to set up for the foreseeable future, so for now it's a waiting game for everyone and they'll be staying here with the comfort of a bed, shelter and some hot food. Well, joining me now is Ashburton Mayor Neil Brown. Kia ora, Neil. Can you tell us, is it still raining there? Yeah, kia ora, Lisa. No, it's not. It's actually stopped and it stopped uh, around about lunchtime today, so um, we're all breathing a wee sigh of relief and starting to smile again because the rain has abated, which means the... Uh, less water going into the Ashburton River, which is the one we're concerned about, and it is dropping. It was at um, 1,400 cumex this morning. It's down now to 1,100, which is still a lot of water, but it's heading in the right direction, so the pressure's certainly coming off us. So, Neil, just to put those numbers in perspective, what does it normally run at? 10 cumex. So it's, um, yeah, even at 1,100, it's still... Um, 110,000 percent, whatever that is, um, higher than normal. But um, it's pointing in the right direction, which is down. So we're just starting to breathe a sigh of relief here now. But you're not out of the woods yet, are you? You're telling people to keep their bags packed still. Yes, we are. It's um, not out of the woods yet. Uh, the stop banks are, are down, now damp and wet. The chances of them breaching are, are less, but it's still possible. There's still a lot of water, and we're still monitoring those stop banks 24-7 to ensure that um, the residents are safe. And uh, if need to evacuate, we will, but um, at this stage, it's probably um, not going to be likely at this stage. But we, if it needs to, we will um, do it if need be. And so in terms of that monitoring and the banks, I mean, what happens? Does someone actually physically go clock them and see if they're holding up or how do you, how do you test or check that? 
Yeah, last night. Well, we used to have um, recorders on them which would tell us what the flow was, but the flood took them out. So we've had to do it manually. And last night we had um, some men were there overnight and stayed the whole night and just watched those, uh, watched the water flow and watched the banks. They did it manually. And the same will happen tonight. Wow, that's um, that's some pretty dedicated workers there. So are you guys effectively trapped to, to the north? Unless you take a helicopter out of there, there's no way out north still? I believe so. The um, Selwyn Bridge is where the uh, Selwyn River is where the bottleneck is. I don't think you can um, get out that way. And the Hines to the south is still closed there. But um, perhaps tomorrow should bring good news there, I think, um, with the floodwaters receding even out of the Hines River. Now, give us a bit of a sit, sit rep in terms of the roads and bridges. Well, how bad is it? Um, well, yesterday we reported we had 19 closed roads and we've still got about 19 closed roads. And we had three bridges which were um, uh, taken out or needed repair. Well, we can update the three to four. We've lost another one. And we think there could be a fifth further on up from that um, one that was um, lost uh, to, that we noticed today. So there's um, we could, obviously because the bridge is not there, we can't get up to check the next one up uh, by vehicle anyway. It's on a low-use road, so uh, the people who are up there are um, uh, all healthy and fit and uh, got all their needs that they need. So, um, yeah, we'll just wait for the floodwaters to recede before we carry on any further to check that final bridge. It's sounding expensive, Neil. Uh, yeah, it's it's probably going to be expensive where seeing some roads now which have been carved out. The tar seal's just been carved off them, um, big holes dug in them, uh, culverts damaged. Yeah, as the water's going down, it's starting to show the um, show the real uh, cost of the, of the um, rain event. So I know it's early days, but what are you thinking? You're running into the millions here if you've got four, potentially five bridges down and significant damage to roads. Overall, the bill, how big? Uh, I think it won't be single millions. It's probably tens to twenties to thirty millions. I'm thinking, but as we progress over time, uh, in the next week or so, we'll start shoring up what that cost is, and and um, obviously we've got to get it repaired. How are the farmers doing? Stock, their stock wandered off, missing, all the rest of it. How are they doing? Um, they're doing really well, um, and they're doing a fantastic job looking after their stock, uh, feeding them, and what have you, in the conditions that we've got. Um, yeah, they certainly need a pat on the back because it's it's not been good out there for them. But they've um, they really stepped up and keeping their stock healthy, and that's what they want to do. The stock are their number one priority, and they're looking after them. Some places we can't get to yet, and there's been um, some helicopters which have dropped feed into those places. Neil, do you think there's been clear communication with people about whether they're okay to stay or whether they have to get up and get out? Uh, yeah, we if we we've only evacuated a few people, and that was voluntary evacu- evacuation. Like last night, there was about sixty people from the Green Street area uh, decided to go, and they moved to uh, family and friends. So um, yeah, and we have cu- uh, communication here. We have an, an app we use on the on our phones to uh, alert people to um, what's going on. They just got to sign up to it. So what's the deal with that, Neil? Is that, is, am I right in understanding that they text their postcode to a particular app and it lets them know? Yeah, they text their postcode to 4196. Then um, they will get the updates that they require. It's a really good system. It's a good way of keeping in touch. And specific to their particular postcode? Yes, it is, Yeah. All the best, Neil. Really appreciate you joining us this evening. That is the Ashburton Mayor, Neil Brown, there. It is 17 minutes past five, and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. And still to come on the programme, Victoria's COVID cases keep climbing with an aged care home in the spotlight. National Party MP Nick Smith is retiring next month after 30 years in Parliament. The List MP says he's stepping down for personal and professional reasons, including an inquiry into an employment issue. Our political reporter Katie Scotcher joins me now from our Parliament office. Katie, what more do we know about, um, well, the investigation? Kia ora, Lisa. Well, we know that a verbal altercation took place in his Wellington office last July. We know that Parliamentary Services has been investing that, investigating that altercation since, and we know that their investigation is ongoing. Other than that, we know very few details about the incident itself, but it appears someone in the media does. In a statement this evening, Nick Smith says he was told on Friday that details of that 
parliamentary services investigation had been leaked to the media and that a story about that investigation was uh, set to be run tomorrow. Now he's obviously gone and preempted that media report by releasing a statement this evening and announcing his resignation. In that statement he said he regrets the incident and has apologised and he said that it was the best course of action for himself, his family and the National Party for him to resign and that he added, he added that his retirement is an opportunity for the National Party to renew. So what happens next then? So he's set to leave uh, Parliament at the end of the current sitting block, so that's uh, the 10th of June. Uh, and he said in, this, in his statement this evening that he'd actually already decided that he was going to leave Parliament at some point this year. It was just a matter of when. Uh, Nick Smith said he was really disappointed to lose the Nelson seat at last year's election to Labour's Rachel Boyack after holding it for 30 years. And by the sounds of things, he wasn't really enjoying being a list MP. He said in his statement that advocating for the Nelson region was what he enjoyed most about the job. Uh, the fact that he's a list MP obviously means that he'll be leaving without a great big fuss and National will likely just bring in the next person on the party list and that person is Hareti Hipango who won the Whanganui seat in 2017 uh, but she was booted out of Parliament at the last election. Katie we don't know yet whether she's keen to come back if she hasn't moved on to another job or anything? No word from her yet we've put in calls to everyone but no radio silence. Thanks for that, Katie. That is Katie Scotcher joining us from our Parliament office there. And the news, Nick Smith is retiring from Parliament, lists a whole lot of professional and personal reasons. I mean, a wee way down in the press release. It says there is an investigation underway into a verbal altercation in his office in Wellington. That happened last July, uh, and apparently it has been leaked to the media. Homai Ofakaro, we'd love your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening. If you're down in some of those sodden areas down south, let us know how you're getting on. You can text us on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Jacinda Ardern's formerly met with her Australian counterpart presenting a united front on China. Scott Morrison delivered a blunt no when asked if New Zealand had sold out its sovereignty to China. It was a whistle-stop tour of Queenstown for Mr Morrison with the two leaders traversing several contentious issues. Our political editor Jane Patterson was there. The trip was filled with trans-Tasman anthems, stories of shared ancestry and much made about the relationship that's as close as family. Wherever I happen to be in Australia or Jacinda happens to be in New Zealand, we are always uh, within close reach to be able to address the many issues we're facing together because we have, we have pursued a very uniquely Anzac path. In the lead up to this meeting, all of the talk was about China. Has New Zealand, through its recent actions and statements, sold out? No, <laughs> is my short answer. Australia and New Zealand are trading nations, but we, neither of us, would ever trade our sovereignty or trade our values. Jacinda Ardern also pushing back on similar questions. Prime Minister Ardern, New Zealand's recent positioning on China has alarmed Australia and Western allies. Are you worried your country's Five Eyes membership could be downgraded? So the short answer to your question would be no. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, you know, at no point in our discussions today was did I detect any difference in our relative positions. But not so united when it comes to Australia's deportation policy and its stripping of terror suspect Sahara Aden of her citizenship. You're very clear that when people come to your country that they have to abide by our laws. Was it appropriate, though, to revoke her citizenship? It was our law, and we believe it was. We've, of course, reiterated our ongoing view on the issue of the cancellation of citizenship on issues of deportation. Uh, Prime Minister Morrison and I have had these exchanges before. He's very clear on New Zealand's view. But Mr Morrison did refer to Sahara Aden's two young children, still the subject of work by officials here and in Australia. Well, Ms Aden's not an Australian citizen. But we have spoken today about uh, her children and the pathway that they have eligibility for in Australia and to stand ready uh, to address those issues. Australia's Defence Minister Peter Dutton made comments in past weeks about not discounting armed conflict with China, a prospect downplayed by Mr Morrison. Strategic competition doesn't need to lead to um, increased likelihood of conflict um, or 
uh, other pressures, whether they be coercion uh, of any nature or interference. That is not necessary. Um, what we both pursue um, through the many ways we work together is a free and open Indo-Pacific. There was some progress from the talks on a long-standing issue, the path to citizenship for New Zealanders in Australia. By reducing the number of years, someone has to reach their required income level from four to three, plus extra flexibility to take COVID into account. Victoria has now recorded 11 new infections in the last day. A COVID cluster in a Melbourne aged care home has grown into three cases after a second staff member has tested positive for COVID-19. World Watch's Paulina Lau has more. Victoria's outbreak may get worse before it gets better. That's the message from Acting Premier James Molino. There is no doubt that this situation is incredibly serious. The next few days remain critical and I want to be really clear with everyone uh, that this outbreak may well get worse before it gets better. Mr Molino says the high-risk exposure sites are concerning. The challenge ahead of us is a very, very significant one. In the past 24 hours, we've identified many more points of concern, um, in addition to the very worrying cases in uh, private aged care. We're also very concerned about the number of other high-risk exposure sites, and we're seeing a small number of cases infecting a large number of contacts. The current outbreak is now more than 50 cases. Today's new cases include infections in the R-Care Maidstone Aged Care Facility. R-Care's CEO Colin Singh says they are well prepared for the outbreak to manage it effectively. He says all workers were being offered their first or second vaccine dose today. It's still unknown how the healthcare provider contracted the virus. In Australia, public aged care is the responsibility of the state government, while private aged care falls under federal responsibility. The union representing allied health professionals in Victoria says it's appalled by the federal government's aged care vaccination program. It says many of its members have been left to fend for themselves. Andrew Hewitt is the Assistant Secretary of the Victorian Allied Health Professionals. Well, we've seen that the, uh, the federal government uh, has responsibility for the majority of aged care centres and they've been slow to start with the vaccine rollout in Victoria and through aged care centres and there's been a lack of transparency. Under the federal government guidelines, aged care workers can only receive Pfizer jabs on site if there's any left over after residents are vaccinated. The circuit breaker lockdown is set for seven days, but whether this will be extended is not yet known. Chief Health Officer Brett Sutton says the trajectory is a day-to-day -day proposition. With more numbers today uh, coming through and those um, really concerning settings, especially in aged care, uh, you know, we're neck and neck with this uh, virus and it's, a, it's an absolute beast. Lifting the state lockdown is dependent on the outbreak and it's not just about the case numbers. Locations, where the cases are linked and if there are high exposure sites will all play a part in the final decision. Waka Kotahi is investigating the possibility of converting a traffic lane on Auckland's Harbour Bridge to a cycleway, but can't say how far off a decision is. On Sunday, hundreds of cyclists pushed past a police barricade and pedalled across the bridge, forcing lane closures. They're frustrated, they say, by a lack of action over calls for a cycle lane trial this summer. But Waka Kotahi's Brett Glidden says it's not that simple. Oh, look, I uh, had no issue whatsoever with the cause. We're committed to walking and cycling as well, and I think it's fantastic that they got such a great turnout because um, it's a really important issue for New Zealand and Auckland. When it comes to getting onto the bridge, I guess I had a few more concerns, and that was simply around the health and safety for everyone involved, not, not just the walkers and cyclists that were on the bridge, but the motorists and our staff who had to um, lay out the, the closure to, to close down the lanes. But as far as the cause, um, absolutely aligned and, and committed as they are to trying to find a solution for this. But is that what they need to do to get your attention because they say you're not listening? Oh, we're listening and we've been listening for a long time. We've are you been doing? Yeah, we are. We've been working on walking and cycling in Auckland for a number of years. We've built um, hundreds of millions of dollars of dedicated cycle lanes. But, but it's about section. the bridge, isn't it, Brett? So if we could stick with the issue, which is the bridge, are you doing when it comes to the bridge and getting bikes over that bridge? Absolutely. Well, there's one tricky issue, and that is the bridge, and that is the hardest part of the network. And so we have been working on solutions for that. We've been looking at whether uh, we can build a northern pathway, and that that that's now with government to consider an option around delivering that. As far as providing 
access to walkers and cyclists onto lanes of the bridge. We are doing work on that. However, it's not as straightforward as um, as everyone seems to think it is. There is a few challenges is that? around it. What, what are the hooks in it? There's, there's a lot of hooks in it, and that's what we've got to do the work on. So the main things that we're looking at is just the health and safety. So you've got to be able to provide a safe environment. The barriers on the side of the bridge, they are not compliant for walking and cycling. They're not high enough. Uh, they're not suitable. If someone was happened to fall off, they could potentially go over the edge. We haven't got any protection back to the live vehicle lane. So we have to think about debris, vehicles that might lose control. We don't want them ending up into those walking and cycle lanes. So you have to come up with a design that is going to be safe for the users walking and cycling across the bridge, but you actually have to come up with a design also that's safe for the motorists that are going to be riding alongside as well. Is so it we realistic? Have to think about all of that. Is it realistic, Brett, to just have one lane dedicated to cyclists, or for the safety reasons that you're talking about there, do you think you would require two if that was going to be an option? So we're looking at that. We think that you're going to require two, um, but we will look at whether you could do it with one. But we think that realistically to put in the barriers and the protection you need for motorists and for walkers and cyclists, it probably is going to require two. It's also quite steep and uh, you've got to have some width for cyclists and walkers using that. They didn't seem to have any problem getting up there on the weekend though, Brett. They were up Uh, there in a flash. Yeah, they were, and we had two lanes closed to allow that to happen. So, But when you talk um, about the steepness of the bridge, there didn't appear to be an issue for cyclists getting to the top of the bridge. No problem with them with the steepness and them walking and cycling up there, but under one lane and the time you put in barriers to protect everybody, you get a very narrow width. So we're thinking about the operational use of this to make sure that if you are going to do it, that you can do it safely for everyone and there is enough room. So, look, we think it's probably too late, but we've got to do the work and complete that to confirm. So could traffic get by with without those two lanes? And that's a really good question, and we have to do that work too. So at the moment, the bridge um, isn't, the, isn't the bottleneck on the network, but if you reduce it from eight lanes to six, um, and it's such a strategic part of the network, it will have an impact. Uh, it will impact other parts of the network, and we saw that last year when we had the lanes out on the bridge with the incident we had on the bridge. It had a big impact across the western ring route right down into the south. So we're mo- we're going to model all of that too. Have you not got any modelling? Have you not got any modelling yet? Because even though you take out two lanes and you go down to six, presumably you're taking some people out of their cars anyway, because that's the whole purpose of the bike lane. So there's there's swings and roundabouts there. Have you not got any modelling on that yet? Absolutely. So the whole intent is you are going to have to get people out of their cars and onto the bike lanes to to make that happen. We've got some models that we need to do more to fully understand the, the potential impacts. So how long is this going to take before you even have an option on the table, a viable well, one? We're looking at options now around how you can do it, but we're not going to be able to make a decision until we're comfortable that we can mitigate all the potential risks. And How I far go off for all that research and material that you need to make a solid decision? We're working on that now, and that's going to happen over the next couple of months. But as far as making a decision, we've got to satisfy ourselves that everyone is going to be safe that's going to use it, whether you're a walking and cycling person or whether you're in a car or a truck or a bus. We've got to make it work, and if it's not going to work, then we're going to have to look at other options. Okay, so this protest group, what they want is they want to cycle line over the summer to test it when they say traffic isn't as dense as it usually is. So given all the things that you say you need to do, how realistic is it that you could have a cycle line up and over that bridge by this summer? As I say, it's not necessarily about the capacity issue. The first issue is the health and safety. So we have to come up with a design that protects walkers and cyclists and vehicles who are using that road uh, and that path. So, Can you do it by the summer? I, I don't know yet, simply because I don't know what's required. So it depends on what we have to do to the barriers on the side. Uh, it depends what consenting we would need to do to, to, to put those in and what construction is required. Until we work all that out, I can't give you a date and say that it would be possible this summer. It may be, but not until we're comfortable that we can safely protect everybody that would be using that facility.
It's iwi e hariaki nei e a checkpoint. The Cantabs out of their homes tonight as floodwaters swell around them. The Auckland councillor telling the government to get a wriggle on with the cycle lane over the bridge. And Qantas offers unlimited free flights for some, so what's the catch? Homai o Fakaro, love to hear from you, particularly about the prospect of a cycle lane on the bridge. Waka Kotahi saying it's not as simple as people think, would take two lanes. OK, here's the question. Would you be prepared to trade off two lanes if you could walk or cycle over Auckland Harbour Bridge? Let us know your thoughts and why. Text us on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or flick us an email, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. It is time now for the headlines with Susanna. Ash Burton's mayor says more evacuations because of flooding are unlikely. Neil Brown told Checkpoint the rain stopped about lunchtime and the Ash Burton River is dropping. He says the chances of stock banks breaching are less but still possible as a lot of water is still coming down. Mr Brown says about 60 people were evacuated last night. 19 roads are cut in the district and four, potentially five, bridges are out. A conserve water notice will remain in place overnight for residents across the Timaru district. The council says the water intakes for all urban and rural schemes have been turned off because of high silt levels. Earlier today, the Defence Force helped to evacuate eight households in the Coopers Creek catchment north of the Orari River. National MP Nick Smith will leave politics after more than 30 years following a verbal altercation in his Wellington office. In a statement, Mr Smith says he's retiring for personal and professional reasons, including a current parliamentary services inquiry into an employment matter. Mr Smith says an investigation into a verbal altercation that happened last July is ongoing. Australia and New Zealand have wrapped up their formal talks in Queenstown, presenting a united front on China. Both Jacinda Ardern and Scott Morrison strongly pushed back on suggestions New Zealand has sold out to China. A magnitude 5.5 earthquake caused moderate shaking in the Lower South Island this afternoon. GeoNet says the earthquake struck 70 kilometres west of Tiano at a depth of 13 kilometres shortly after 4 o'clock. More than 500 people have reported shaking to GeoNet. Motorists are being warned State Highway 1 near Greta Valley in North Canterbury has been blocked by a crash between a truck and a car. The highway is closed at Scargill Valley Road and there are no detours. St John says two people are being treated for minor injuries. Those are the latest news headlines on RNZ National. Our next news and weather update is at 6. Thanks, Susanna. No mai hoki mai. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint, Call Lisa Owen Tene. And it is time for the business news now with Nona Peltier. Nona, the Reserve Bank, this is interesting. I'm really interested in this because of the situation at the Waikato DHB as well. It experienced a data breach. What was that, Christmas time, beginning last year? It was actually, well, it happened on December 16th, but the Reserve Bank only really became aware of it on January 6th. Right. So So that was a while. Yeah, they've had this independent investigation and what can you tell us? What's been the outcome? Okay, so KPMG did the report. The Reserve Bank received the report. We haven't been able to talk to either of those parties. They don't want to comment to us. They just said the report stands on its own and the lessons learned from that are just clearly outlined in that 10-page report. And basically what happened was there was a breach But it happened just before Christmas, and I guess everyone was just uh, too busy to really pay attention to what was the problem. And so the Reserve Bank didn't get an alert from the company that provided the service. It was a third party. It's a company called Acelian. And the report suggests that the Reserve Bank was far too reliant on this particular company for the management of sensitive data. And so on December 16th, when there was a breach, the company sent out a notice to update their software. Software. But it was Christmas time and no one did because I guess they thought, hmm, just a normal everyday time to upgrade your software kind of request without realizing it was required to fix the cyber breach because they weren't told. Right. So there, there are a number of things in there, like uh, I suppose the report suggests that there were four warnings about um, pending problems. Again, you say the supplier sent an email to them. They apparently didn't get it. It didn't get through. That's ha- right. Ha- have they Have they kind of, um, and, and also the need for sort of 24-7 
staff to be available to fix things, which yes. is what you were alluding to, yeah. should things go awry. How far are they through doing all the things that they should it's to get up to speed? It's hard to say from this report, but I can say that when they finally realised the severity of the issue, that was on January 6th, and within 24 hours they had updated the software and provided this, you know, the protection. And then through to after that, they were working on it for months. It cost them three and a half million dollars to fix. Yeah, which they makes you wonder up. how much Waikato DHB's issue oh, is costing. Oh gosh, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, we'll see what kind of report that uh, investigation results in. But in this case, the Reserve Bank governor said, you know, look, we're sorry this happened. Uh, we've taken all the steps we need to. We're training our staff. We've got new processes in place to deal with alerts. So I guess, you know, something that sort of like fix your software, just fix it, you know, don't worry about why, just do it, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, overall, I guess it was quite a hard lesson for the Reserve Bank to learn. It could have been a lot worse. I mean, they did manage to plug the gap. They, they did lose information. Um, and are we privy to what that information no, is? No, I don't know very much about it. Uh, the report isn't uh, very specific. It's not a it's called the public summary. Goodness yeah. knows there must be another one somewhere else because this one's a pretty somewhat vague yeah. on the detail. And I suppose that's fair enough because, I mean, you don't want to reveal everything you know about the Reserve Bank security systems. Uh, but a timely reminder and perhaps raises more questions than it may be answered, eh? Well, yeah. certainly this is the public summary. No one wanted to talk about it. They said that whatever the lessons learned, whatever they are, are in this report. Okay, let's move on to A2, which is never far from the spotlight. What's going on with them again? Well, A2 milk. A2 milk. It's okay. People will remember this is the darling of the market, you know, went all the way up to becoming the very biggest company on the market. And, But, you know, in the last nine months, they've had a heck of a time, and they've managed to come back to the market with four different uh, updates on their guidance. Now, you know, four times in nine months, that just tells you that you don't really have a handle on where things are with your business. And so the Australians, they love to take class action suits and they're investigating whether or not, according to the Australian Financial Review, they're looking at taking a class action suit this is the shareholders, against A2 Milk for their incompetence and not being able to provide a proper uh, guidance, you know, like most companies once it depending on a situation. And most people are thinking you guys are obviously haven't done your your job properly with continuous disclosure. Because if you'd been continuously disclosing things, there wouldn't have been these surprised updates. You know, well, look, I'm not a lawyer. Sounds like an unusual circumstance, though. Yeah. Uh, one to watch. Well, it's one to watch. We talked to the Shareholders Association here and asked them what they thought, and they didn't really want to comment because they don't know a lot about the legals in, legal ins and outs. But suffice to say, the law firm there, which is uh, the company's name is Slater & Gordon, is certainly looking into the matter. Whether or not this goes ahead, who knows? In any case, the market didn't really like that, and uh, A2 Milk share price dropped about a third of a percent today. And how's the rest of the market well, going? Well, actually, it ended up 1.1%. So that was a very strong market. Uh, that was a 138-point gain to 12,321. That could be that this is just a catch-up because, you know, our our market was down for a while. Could be that some of these uh, stocks are looking a little bit uh, like bargains. So we have saw some people come back into the market. It is a bit quiet. It's a, a, an odd day because both the U.S. and the U.K. are on holiday Monday. So we expect there's not as many people active in the market. The New Zealand dollar is still steady at 72.6 U.S. cents, 94 Australian and 51.1 British pence. Thanks, Nona. Nona Peltier with Business. Canterbury residents are being urged to remain on high alert following evacuations to parts of the region today. The extent of flooding and heavy rain gobsmacked North Canterbury locals as people living near rivers were told to leave and go to higher ground. The Waimakarere District Mayor met with Acting Civil Defence Minister Chris Farfoy and Rangi Ora ready to act after a state of emergency was declared in Canterbury. Alicia Foon was there. A wet, windy and wild start for Cantabrians following evacuations due to heavy rain and flooding. Rangiora local Jess Davidson says in the eight years she's lived in the region, she's seen nothing like this. That river's pretty crazy and I live not too far from it, so it's it's a bit scary. Um, I think the sheer amount of water that's coming down from the, the headwaters is just mind-boggling. We were actually t- took the kids down to the river last week and we were skimming stones in it and it was so 
dry, you know. And the ground is so hard that it's all just run off. So um, it's quite hard to comprehend how much water is coming down that river at the moment. It's crazy. For many in Rangiora, it's meant no work or school. The Ashley River was really full, extremely full. I don't know how much more it can take. It did affect us a little bit, actually. We had our wee leak in our roof. So that's always fun when you've got a toddler, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so now we've got to get that fixed and they said it might be up to like two weeks before they get an assessor out for the insurance. My kids' school is closed. I work in the city, so I wasn't too sure about crossing over the YMAC, so we decided to stay at home today. This thing on the news is pretty crazy and people stranded. Yeah, I think a lot of people have opened up their places to their friends and family, so um, it's worked pretty well, I think. Day off today because I work for a building company and can't do much in this. Got a couple of friends up in Fernside and they had to leave last night because the like, creek behind their house was overflowing. Residents of low-lying areas of the Pines Beach in the Waimakariri district were ordered to evacuate this morning with river levels threatening homes. Two welfare centres set up to take evacuees are close to empty as many opt to stay with family and friends. Waimakariri District Mayor Dan Gordon describes the flooding as unprecedented as he gave residents around the Air River the green light to return home. Around the Ashley we're still uh, monitoring that carefully. Pines uh, Beach we are presently evacuating residents there and we're keeping a watching brief in the Waikoku uh, locality. Waimakariri Civil Defence Controller Tracy Tierney says people who evacuated near Ashley River returned home but it's a fast changing situation. They have returned so at the moment it's a little bit of a moving feast because people self evacuated as well um, which is great because people took responsibility for themselves so it's been really great to see how people are responding and being really aware of their environment um, and it is really fast changing information that we're getting through so great support from ECAN giving us information on rivers and we've got a lot of our crew out and about so probably the developing situation at Pines Beach and at Waikuku is something that we're monitoring. Acting Civil Defence Minister Chris Farfoy has been on the ground working with Waimakariri Council and Civil Defence. Civil Defence teams are busy. Uh, again, they're asking people who are in areas where there are road closures to avoid all non-essential travel. So um, if we can reinforce that message uh, to people to keep safe. As some of those in the Pine Beach area, um, as many people have, um, who are either going to friends or family, uh, there are civil defence centres available to them, so there are, there are options for many people. In these kinds of situations, a lot of people do go to friends and family in order to make sure that they've got somewhere safe to stay. Christchurch appears to have avoided the worst of the rainfall, but some streets are closed due to flooding and a small sinkhole has developed in the central city. Meanwhile, parts of Akaroa Township are experiencing severe flooding, which appears to be caused by blocked pipes. Council staff and contractors are on site assessing the situation. Residents there have been asked to conserve water. The Student Army is also preparing to step in to help with the clean-up that will be required after the flooding in Canterbury. It's a quarter to six. I'm Lisa Owen and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. And Muriaki in Pitsapitsa Korero after the news at six will be in Ashburton with the very latest on the flooding there. Computer services remain offline at all Waikato DHB hospitals nearly two weeks after a ransomware cyber attack brought it all to a grinding halt. The DHB says while good progress is being made to restore all IT systems, it won't commit to any time frame. Over the weekend, a small number of elective surgeries were carried out and outpatient clinics held. Clinics and surgeries are expected to again run at about 80% capacity this week. Andrew McRae reports. DHB Chief Executive Kevin Snee again fronted the media, starting with a well-worn line acknowledging his staff. By thanking all staff who kept patients uh, safe over the weekend and the staff who worked to maintain services, including those uh, staff who are working hard behind the scenes uh, to keep things going. He says priority areas for the restoration of IT services include radiation therapy, lab systems, radiology for imaging and the patient management system. There's still a bit of a way to go in a number of these areas before we have functioning services. One thing to bring services online, to bring the servers online and then you have to make the service ready. So for example in relation to radiotherapy, um, there's quite a, a number of things to calibrate the machines and so on because they're quite complicated pieces of kit and that's going to be being done uh, throughout this week. Dr Snee says the majority of people identified last week who may have had their personal information taken by the hackers have now been contacted. 
It's obviously made a little more difficult because we don't have full access to our systems um, with patient, patient information. Uh, we're continuing to investigate the files. Um, we're not able to give any numbers at this point, but we are continuing to review the files and, and come to a, a judgment about uh, what data has and has not been accessed. A special helpline set up to deal with anyone who has concerns about their privacy being invaded has received 24 calls over the last five days. Dr Snee warns against any opportunistic scams. People sending emails on the, on the hope that they'll be able to you know, uh, scam you. Um, so we have to be mindful of that. Equally, uh, we've, we've heard um, stories of people who've been contacted by our services who then said um, they're not sure whether you're, uh, you're scamming us. So they've, they've then called us back and, uh, and we've, um, we've been able to confirm this is actually the hospital content. So that people are obviously al alert. You encourage it, I guess. Absolutely. He says while they are counting the cost of the cyber attack, they aren't adding it up as yet. I think that's for a later date. We're just making sure that we identify and itemise any additional costs. He says all DHBs have insurance for cybercrime. The resources that insurance companies have are put, at our, uh, put alongside us to help uh, with these matters as well. And obviously with any um, insurance, uh, there's a kind of limit to cover. So, um, uh, so I think we'll, we'll just um, itemise everything and we'll have a discussion when we're through the other side of this. The DHB says all discharges are being manually noted and notes are sent to a patient's GP. It says downloading information to electronic files is part of a recovery process, but it can't estimate yet how long that would take. A lack of progress on a cycle path across the Harbour Bridge is grinding the gears of Auckland Councillor Chris Darby. Hundreds of people barged through a police barricade yesterday and took over two lanes of the bridge, saying they're frustrated at delays in getting a trial cycle lane up and running by the summer. Auckland Councillor Chris Darby made the dash with them and joins me now. Kia ora, Chris. So you're a fugitive from the law, are you? Oh, no, I don't think I'm a fugitive from the law. I'm just one of uh, 1,500 that uh, attended a, a gathering which... In, in, uh, ended up being a ride across the bridge for an hour, Lisa. And what do you think you achieved by doing that? Uh, look, I think we've uh, brought a lot more attention, uh, particularly the attention of the government to this issue. Um, it's uh, a long-standing one. It's unresolved. There's been a lot of um, uh, good feedback from the government over the last year or so, but there's a real desire for some certainty. We don't have that right now. You can't cycle on feedback, levels. though, can you, Chris? You can't cycle on feedback. So no. Yeah. No, we, we want some certainty. The frustration levels have just really boiled up, Lisa. So you are saying, I've seen you tweeting, that you're confident the new Minister of Transport shares the, the Sky Path vision and is, is on board. Let's give it a week. Why give it a week? What do you know that we don't? Well, look, uh, you've only got to put a few things together and work it out. Um, the SkyPath funding uh, is currently part of the New Zealand Upgrade Program, which was, a, which was announced last year, last January. It's a, it's a big program, an ambitious program that the government put up, some $6.8 billion in, in transport across the country. Um, but um, they've run into some headwind on that program. They've got evolving business cases and they've got massive construction inflation pressures and they have to recalibrate that program. Now, they have to do that in time to inform the regional transport committees all around the country, in our case, Auckland Council and Auckland Transport, so that we can grapple and land our regional land transport plan because there's consequential spend, there's an intertwining. So it's pretty clear that government have to make some calls on the New Zealand Upgrade Program in double quick time. So are you saying in the next week to two weeks they would have to let you know what the lay of the land is on the project so that you can fire up? So you should know either way within a fortnight? Government uh, need to tell us on the lay of the land on a whole raft of New Zealand Upgrade Program uh, projects and programmes and uh, the uh, sky path across the Harbour Bridge is one of those in the Auckland part of that overall programme, yes. 
So even so, I mean, that kind of stuff takes time, doesn't it? What, what's your realistic expectation on, on when you would be able to cycle over the bridge? Well, the first thing is you need some certainty. You need some direction. You need a final call that there is going to be a project. It is funded. And then I think those 1,500 cyclists, if they had have known on Sunday that there was going to be a project that's going to start on an X date and finish on an X date and we can ride it on an X date, they would not have turned up. Um, but we don't have that. I am hopeful that the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Transport can find a way through and give that certainty quite soon. So even if they do that, though, right, and there's a project in the pipeline for for whatever form it takes, a, a, a bridge alongside the bridge, whatever, in the meantime, do you still want one of the traffic lanes on the bridge to be dedicated as a bike and pedestrian lane while you wait for something that is purpose-built? Yes, certainly. That's an option that we'll continue to pursue. And we, we treat it as an option. We'd like to work that up with Waka Kotahi uh, and look at the business case for that. Look at how that might or might Because they reckon work. it's harder than it looks, Chris. That's what they say. It's harder than it looks. There's safety issues. There's wind issues on the bridge. The, the, um, the barriers are not designed for cyclists. You could go over the edge. A car could smack into you. They say, well, they say it's hard. Yep, look, there's always barriers. If you turn away at the first barrier that faces you when you're confronting the issues of transport in Auckland, you'll never get anything done. There's a whole bunch of us that aren't prepared to turn away at those barriers. We want to look at solutions, not being, uh, you know, being stuck in concrete on the problem itself. There are solutions there. Right now, we can't even get cyclists on ferries and the number that want to be on ferries to cross the harbour from the North Shore uh, to to learning and earning in the city centre at the moment. We've got some big problems. So, Chris, worst case scenario, two weeks' time, you still don't have any movement, no promises and no project. What do you do, fire your bike up and hit the bridge again? There is a risk of that. People are frustrated. I'm hopeful that we don't have to go there, Lisa. I'm hopeful of a positive uh, announcement from the Minister But are you prepared to, Chris, if you do not get the result that you want in the next fortnight, are you suggesting there could be further process on the bridge involving biking? I am prepared and I know that there are a lot of other people that are prepared to take this further. To what extent, I don't know. Um, but the protest uh, in support of Skypath across the Auckland Harbour uh, is not going away anytime soon. Thanks for your time tonight. That is Chris Darby, Auckland councillor, who was who was among the people who, uh, well, he rode his bike over the bridge on the weekend. Um, and we're getting a lot of feedback on this, on the on the Harbour Bridge. This person says, get a cycle-only ferry running from Birkenhead to the other side. And I don't know, because that's boating, isn't it? Not cycling. Kind of defeats the purpose. Another person says, two lanes down. Ha ha, gridlock. Whoa, there's a lot of people who do not want to give up their um, traffic lanes for bikes. Uh, Janie says, the bridge can't cope with present traffic, removing any lane for a few cyclists, especially during the week, would be madness. And then Tim says, yes, 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 bring on the walk and cycle lanes. Another person says, you're asking the wrong question. The question should be, at Auckland, is Auckland prepared for greater gridlock on their motorways to provide casual cyclists the opportunity to cycle and walk over the bridge? Another listener here obviously listened to the Waka Kotahi interview. They're saying there were five-year-olds cycling up the bridge, so it's not hard or a steep slope. And this one says a lane should be dedicated to buses long before there's one for bikes. Over 100,000 people use the Northern Expressway every day, this listener says, and this change would require no research and no construction. Mark from Point Chev's got in touch to say, hell yes to cycling over the bridge. Hello climate change, hello congestion mitigation. If we don't change our transport modes, we're toast. Literally, says Mark. Qantas is offering unlimited travel for a year for people who get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's among an incentive program the airline is rolling out, encouraging people to get the vaccine so they can get back travelling. Ten families will win unlimited travel for a whole year and there are other prizes, including flight credits and vouchers. Qantas CEO Alan Joyce told Nine News the airline is throwing its weight behind the vaccine because it wants people travelling. 
So we're trying our best to help with this rollout. I'm encouraging a Team Australia moment with every other corporate out there uh, to help with this vaccine rollout and to uh, to uh, to reward people that have having the vaccine. Uh, this this program that we're putting in place will be launched in July. It will be retrospective. It will include anybody that has already been vaccinated and will apply to anybody that is vaccinated till the end of 21. And I think that's what we all should be doing is really encouraging it. Alan Joyce says he's keen to see the Trans-Tasman bubble extended further. We've seen huge demand for Aussies wanting to get to New Zealand, a little less for, for New Zealanders coming here. And particularly Queenstown for the ski season is doubled in terms of demand to pre-COVID levels. So we're hoping the Pacific Islands, Fiji, Vanuatu, uh, there's potentially a lot of destinations uh, that we could be operating to. We have the aircraft, we have the crew, we still a lot of aircraft and a lot of people stood down. So the more destinations we can open up, we'll, we'll, we'll to put aircraft in. We're just after covering cash costs. We just want to get people back to work. That was Qantas CEO Alan Joyce speaking to Nine News. Japanese tennis star Naomi Osaka has been warned she could be disqualified from the French Open and has been fined $20,000 for refusing to attend press conferences. Tennis authorities said she could face being banned from Grand Slam tournaments if she ignores her media obligations. The BBC's Ben Croucher has more. Staying silent off the court on Sunday, Naomi Osaka let her tennis do the talking. Up against Patricia Maria Teague of Romania, the second seed was pushed hard in the opening round of the French Open, but came through in straight sets. Now, before the tournament, Osaka decided to boycott post-match press conferences to protect her mental health, a time where no words can still make the headlines. But as Osaka was tight-lipped, Grand Slam organisers made their view loud and clear. In response, they issued a statement saying Naomi Osaka chose not to honour her contractual obligations. The referee therefore issued her a $15,000 fine. They add that the mental health of players is of utmost importance to the Grand Slams, but should she continue to ignore her media obligations during the tournament, she would expose herself to possible code of conduct infringement consequences, including defaulting from the French Open, further fines and future Grand Slam suspensions. Osaka may be keeping quiet for now, but soon she could have more than just the press to answer to. And that report was from Ben Croucher. Now, some of your feedback, this delightful one on the flooding, if you can have del delightful flooding feedback, says, in rain-soaked Littleton, Ashley Bloomfield, the cat, has used the opportunity of three days of rain to devote her life to becoming a lap cat after spending the first year of her life snubbing all attempts to get her to snuggle into any laps on offer. We'll have more on the flooding after six but Waka Kotahi has an update on their website saying there are currently 10 state highway closures in place throughout Canterbury and weather conditions could continue to worsen and water levels will remain high. Check out their website for the exact details. RNZ News at 6, I'm Mahi Nui, ko Susana Layata with the NA. The Mayor of Ashburton is predicting the flood water clean-up cost could stretch into the tens of millions of dollars. Residents are breathing a sigh of relief tonight with the rain subsiding and river levels dropping, but Neil Brown has told Checkpoint the flood waters have caused widespread and expensive damage. I think it won't be single millions, it's probably tens to twenties to thirty millions, I'm thinking. But as we progress over time, uh, in the next week or so, we'll start shoring up what that cost is and, and um, obviously we've got to get it repaired. Neil Brown says roads and culverts have been damaged and up to five bridges have been destroyed or are in need of repair. A Heinz family is settling in for a second night at a welfare centre as floodwaters continue to make life difficult for people in the mid-Canterbury town. Heinz remains completely surrounded by floodwaters, which have also closed State Highway 1. Tamati Edwards, his partner, and their three young children had an hour to collect a few of their belongings late yesterday when water started spilling over a stop bank on the Heinz River. He's grateful space was available at the Hakatere Marae near Ashburton, which is serving as a welfare centre. Good feed, good car, good sleep, yeah. warm, yeah. friendly, it's good, it's good, it's what you need. Because we had nowhere, we didn't know anywhere to go, because our family are from Timaru, Tamuka. Tamati Edwards is nervous about what they'll find when they're finally allowed back into their house. 
Waka Kotahi says parts of State Highway 1 south of Christchurch are likely to remain closed until Tuesday afternoon. It says crews will not be able to start clearing the road at Dunsandal and at Hines south of Ashburton until tomorrow. It says it hopes to have the Arthurs Pass route to the west coast partially open by Thursday. National MP Nick Smith will leave politics after more than 30 years following a verbal altercation in his Wellington office. Mr Smith says he's retiring for personal and professional reasons, including a current parliamentary services inquiry into an employment matter. Here's political reporter Katie Scotcher. Nick Smith says an investigation into a verbal altercation that took place last July is still ongoing. He says details of that inquiry have been leaked to the media and it's inappropriate for employment disputes to be litigated in public. Mr Smith says he regrets the incident and has apologised, but the best course of action is for him to resign. He says he'd already decided he was going to retire this year after losing the Nelson seat. The only question was was when Mr Smith will leave Parliament on June the 10th. New Zealanders living and working in Australia will soon only have to wait three years before they can apply for citizenship. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and her Australian counterpart Scott Morrison confirmed the change after their annual talks today. From July, the number of years in which applicants for the streamlined pathway to citizenship must reach the minimum income threshold will drop from four years to three. The Prime Minister's also welcomed Australia's flexibility for applicants whose income or time offshore had been affected by the pandemic. The new visa pathway will be reviewed again in 2022. Environmentalists fear new government measures to fast-track decisions protecting ecologically significant land could lead to more mining on the conservation estate. The land, called stewardship land, makes up about 10% of the country. The government has announced plans to streamline the process for deciding what areas need special protection and is establishing expert panels to advise it. Coromandel watchdog of Hauraki chairperson Catherine Delahunty fears it opens the doors to miners. If they get consent, for example, to mine under Wharekereponga before this review is even started in that area, there is nowhere to go. You know, there is no real protection from the industry. And we're very, very concerned that the, the stewardship review is a red herring rather than a commitment to a promise. Catherine Delahunty says the Labour Party must stick to its promise to ban new mines on Department of Conservation land. Samoa's Court of Appeal has begun hearing an appeal against a Supreme Court ruling on the constitutionality of a sixth women's seat in Parliament. The recent ruling tipped the post-election stalemate into a 26-25 victory for the emergent fast party of Fiamme Naomi Mata'afa. Hundreds of women marched at the streets of Apia this morning in support of the Human Rights Protection Party's appeal. The HRPP argues that voiding the additional seat violates a constitution Constitutional provision requiring at least 10% of MPs be women. A ruling is expected by the end of the week. It's coming up to five minutes past six. Competition leaders, uh, the Northern Stars, can expect a much closer contest against the tactics in tonight's ANZ Netball Premiership match that the 14-goal win they enjoyed last month in Auckland than the 14-goal win they enjoyed last month in Auckland. The Stars' five-game winning run ended last week with a loss to the Pulse, while the Tactics have won three conservative games. The consecutive games, the Tactics will be a stronger unit with Shooter Thepaya Selby Rickett back, having missed the 57-43 loss. But the coach, Marianne Hoshek, is wary of the Stars' backlash following their loss to the Pulse. They'll um, be wanting to come out firing on that one so I think it's going to be a really good contest but yeah we are quite different from the team we were when we played them last so um, we're pretty confident that we can give them a good game. Tonight's match starts at 7.15. The Chiefs at Trans-Tasman Super Rugby match against the Rebels has been moved from Saturday to Sunday due to the COVID outbreak in Melbourne. The Highlanders beat the Rebels 42-27 to at a neutral venue in Sydney last night to remain unbeaten after three rounds. French tennis open organisers say world number two Naomi Osaka faces expulsion from the event and future Grand Slams if she continues to refuse to speak to the media. The Japanese player said last week she won't give any news conferences during Roland Garros because she wants to protect her mental health. Osaka has been fined $20,000 for not speaking to media after her first round win. That's the news. 
Tonight on Night's Pacific Sport with Vinnie Wiley. Murray Edmund remembers Auckland in the 1960s, a time to make a song and dance, that's the name of his book, when old and new ideas were clashing, while Cindy Nguyen and Arlen and Noble from Papatoi Toi and Wellington High Schools offer us views on life and out there are in 2021 from the perspective of those born this side of the century. On Nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Meet Service to Midnight tomorrow. A red warning, the red warning remains in force for Canterbury until this evening. Northland, Auckland and Coromandel showers, some heavy, easing and clearing Auckland and Coromandel tomorrow morning. Wai, Katotu, Taranaki, also Bay of Plenty and Central High Country. Cloudy periods, a few showers for Taranaki, possibly heavy, becoming fine tomorrow. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, isolated showers becoming widespread for a time tomorrow morning, then retreating to the coast. Whanganui to Wellington, also wider upper and Marlborough. Periods of rain, easing to a few showers tomorrow morning, clearing to fine by the evening. Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, a few showers in Nelson and Buller, clearing and becoming fine everywhere this evening. Cloud developing tomorrow with drizzle south of the glaciers. Canterbury, rain with heavy falls, easing tonight, showers tomorrow gradually clearing and becoming fine. Otago and Southland, a few showers clearing tomorrow and becoming fine. And Chatham Islands, a few showers. RNZ National, it's eight minutes past six. Kia ora rā e hoa, no mai hauki mai. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint called Lisa Owen Tene. Ashburton residents are being told to keep their bags packed in case the call to evacuate comes. The town has been effectively cut off with air the only way out to the north and main roads to the south inundated as well. Our reporter Louise Tanuth is in Ashburton and joins us now. Kia ora Louise, what is the situation for Ashburton right now? Yeah, hi Lisa, I'm here at the Ashburton River where river levels are falling but it still could take a few days for things to drain around here. So the general advice for residents as given by the Mayor at today's press conference was to keep those bags packed in case those stop banks do indeed fall at the moment, they're at risk of that. Um, and their general advice is to avoid all kinds of travel and remain home so don't get out on those roads. There are around 17 road, roads closed at the moment including the main ones going back into Christchurch so at the moment the general advice is just stay home um, and avoid all travel. So you have been out and about talking to locals and seeing the conditions for yourself. What was it like there today? Absolutely, Lisa. So we've been out and about on the road today trying to get through to Mount Summers and Hines. Uh, both of those roads have been blocked, but along the way we've been speaking to farmers. Most of them we couldn't get to as the floodwaters were, you know, a couple metres between us, so we just had to yell over. But the people that we spoke to were kind of frantically moving their animals. There were cows running across the road. Everyone was all hands on deck. And one of the farmers that I spoke to today, he was really panicked. Uh, he told me that the water level was just inches from coming into his home and it had already flooded his paddock so you know the general um, feeling around the town is that everyone's in it together but again we don't know just how bad this flooding will be for the community here. Thank you, Louise. That is our reporter, Louise Tanuth, joining us from Ashburton. A jury's been told a man who died in custody likely would have survived if he had have got the medical treatment he needed. Three Taranaki police officers are on trial charged with manslaughter over the death of Alan Ball. Mr Ball died on the concrete floor of the Hawara police station in the early hours in June 2019. Our Taranaki Whanganui reporter Robin Martin has been at the High Court in New Plymouth. Mr Ball died of a self-inflicted overdose of codeine, tramadol and alcohol. The Crown argues the officers failed in their duty of care for him and are culpable for his death. The defence team says the officers who have name suppression made mistakes but that does not make them criminals. Today the jury heard from emergency medicine specialist Dr Paul Quigley. He said the drug and alcohol cocktail Mr Ball had taken was a lethal mix. That combination would mean that he steadily get into an unconscious state as we saw, his breathing weight would drop, he would slowly build up a poisonous gas that we all make called carbon dioxide and then as that level rises that also creates coma until you reach the point where you basically go into what's known as respiratory arrest so you stop breathing. At that point first responders would have four minutes to give a patient oxygen to save their life. But Dr Quigley said an ambulance crew would have spotted Mr Ball had opiates in his system. A combination of decreased breathing rate 
plus very, very small pupils means opiate poisoning. And they would have the ability to give a drug called naloxone, which reverses opiates and would actually up his breathing and may even wake him somewhat. Crown Prosecutor Cherie Clark asked him how long that would take to work. And how quickly does the Noxalone reverse the effects of the opiates? On the end of the needle. It's basically as you give it. Dr Quigley, who was yet to be cross-examined, was also asked about Mr Ball's level of consciousness on CCTV footage of the incident. He said Mr Ball appeared deeply unconscious and unresponsive from the time he arrived at the Hawara police station, comments that mirrored those of an earlier expert witness. Former paramedic André Slyriendrech, who's the managing director of a police first aid training provider, observed Mr Ball made no deliberate movements and was unresponsive. Under cross-examination from Susan Hughes, Mr Slyriendrech was asked if the officers had any reason to believe that he was not simply drunk, as they believed. In this instance, they would have no reason to suspect that in fact Mr Ball was not simply a drunk man sleeping, would they? I think the primary indicator is that he got in the car and he couldn't get out. But up to that point, they had no reason to think that Absolutely he was... not. I agree. Thank you. Under re-examination, Ms Clark pointed out Mr Ball fell asleep in the car and had to be carried into the station by six people. She asked if that sounded like a drunk sleeping it off. It is totally beyond sleeping and I would question that that occurred in the car. This is when a major decision should have been made that medical help be sought. So with those facts on board, by the time he gets into the cell, is it consistent with sleeping or unconsciousness? With unconsciousness. The Crown was due to end its case today. It is 13 minutes past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. A former senior manager of a building supplies company says he wouldn't have bought a house clad with his own company's product over his fears it would leak. That cladding from the company James Hardy is now at the centre of a $220 million court case alleging leak is exactly what it did. John Bond reports from the Auckland High Court. Bradley Bridges was on James Hardy's global group management team in California in the 1990s. He told the High Court at Auckland he thought from early on that there was a risk the Hardy text cladding would leak. But I remember thinking it would need to be tested fully and installed to exist exacting standards. Otherwise, there would be potential for water ingress and potential failure. I remember thinking that I would not buy a house built with that system. He said during his time on the global group management team, the GMT, they discussed reports that the cladding had weather tightness issues in New Zealand. I also remember learning that councils and builders were being hammered with leaky building claims and I could not understand why there were not more claims against James Hardy. My thinking at the time was that James Hardy was dodging a bullet. Mr Bridges said James Hardy New Zealand informed the GMT that Hardy Tech's issues were not a product defect, but rather the builders installing it wrong. The product was only sold in New Zealand and Mr Bridges said the global team didn't give it much attention. When reports of issues with fibre cement products in New Zealand market filtered through to the GMT, they were not taken as seriously as required at the start and not taken as seriously as they should have been and we did not take steps to address them. I say this with the benefit of hindsight. New Zealand was not a focus when there were massive market penetration opportunities in the United States. Mr Bridges left the GMT in late 2000. The cladding kept being manufactured and sold in New Zealand until 2005. The defendant's lawyer, Jack Hodder QC, immediately disputed some of Mr Bridges' recall, including rather cut and dry ones like which year he moved to the United States. So you say in 2001 you were transferred to the US head office in Mission Viejo. The document we have on the screen is dated October 1998. Do you think the document might have it right? I'm basing my evidence on my memory. The organisational changes might have occurred prior to physical relocation and, you know, it was 20 years ago. However, through his hours of evidence, Mr Bridges did then go on to recall a significant amount of detail about the time. Mr Hodder went on to challenge the likelihood of Mr Bridges having much knowledge of the product, saying he did not have responsibility for New Zealand operations nor the manufacturing of Hardy Tex. The trial before Justice Fata continues and will likely go through to September. 
A South Island iwi is taking legal action against the government, saying it's been shut out of discussions about the protection given to ecologically important land. The stewardship land makes up about 10% of the country and contains valuable forests and homes to threatened species. The government has announced plans to speed up decisions about which parcels of land will get the most protection, setting up independent expert panels to help advise it. But environmental groups fear it's a red herring that could lead to more mining on conservation land. Hamish Cardwell has the story. Most of the 2.5 million hectares of stewardship land was given to the Department of Conservation more than three decades ago. It's been languishing in limbo ever since. It's about a third of the total land under the department's protection. But working out what parts need serious protection and what can be developed is difficult and expensive. Before the 2020 election, the Prime Minister promised to get cracking, and it has announced plans to streamline the process and bring in expert panels to advise it. But that move has prompted outrage from South Island iwi Naitahu. It says a large portion of Naitahu Takiwa is affected, and decisions about the land are of utmost significance to the iwi. It says it should have been involved from the get-go and that it's been shut out of the process, a clear breach of the treaty partnership. It's filed urgent legal proceedings to put a stop to it. Meanwhile, Catherine Delahunty, who chairs anti-mining group Coromandel Watchdog of Hauraki, fears that while the panel evaluation process drags on, more mining will be happening on conservation land. If they get consent, for example, to mine under Wharekereponga before this review is even started in that area... There is nowhere to go. You know, there is no real protection from the industry. And we're very, very concerned that the the stewardship review is a red herring rather than a commitment to a promise. Catherine Delahunty says the Labour Party must make good on its 2017 promise to ban new mines on dock land. She's worried wording in the government PR announcing the new measures signals the government is backing away from that pledge. So basically they're creating two classes of land within the conservation estate, which puts at risk large areas of land that is yet to be reviewed and we don't know what the reviews will say anyway. Forest and Bird Chief Executive Kevin Haig says the panels must recognise that almost all of the stewardship land is highly ecologically valuable. The main thing for us is that the reclassification process properly understands the conservation values that each of these places has. We know that this land generally has high or extremely high conservation values. So actually being clear about what those are, clear about the right level of protection, that's very, very important. He says protecting the forests we have, and planting more, is absolutely critical to meeting our climate commitments. So the panel should err on the side of giving land extra protections. And that means that even even land that currently doesn't have exceptionally high values may become very important for that reforestation work. And so we'd like to see that recognised in this process. Mr Haig says it would be easier and quicker to grant all stewardship land the higher protection and deal with the exceptions on a case-by-case basis. Acting Conservation Minister Aisha Verrill says in a statement that the expert panel is only a step in the review. She says iwi will be involved through the process and the public will be able to give input. She can't comment on the Naitahu legal proceedings as it may be before the courts. As India grapples with a devastating second wave of COVID, families are falling victim to scams offering fake drugs and medical supplies. Police in Delhi have arrested 350 people on suspicion of fraud. The BBC's Ola Guerin reports from Delhi. As COVID cases soared here and critical medical supplies dwindled, police say established fraudsters spotted a business opportunity. They began trawling social media for victims, offering fake oxygen and counterfeit drugs to desperate families. Prem Nath, a joint commissioner for cybercrime in Delhi, who has been in the force for 30 years, says these offences are a new low. You can consider this as a crime against humanity also. Mankind also. People are suffering. They are asking you to deliver something to save their life and you are cheating them. It's uh, very painful to see this situation. Ayana Rator, a Delhi lawyer, paid five times the normal price for the antiviral drug remdesivir for her mother. 
The injections were fake and her 50-year-old mother, Sadhana, died this month. She was everything to me. She was a friend to me. She was a sister to me. Even we used to go on dates, me and mom. We, we call it dates. We call it movie dates, lunch date, dinner date. We had that connection. I'm just incomplete without her. Who do you blame for your mother's death? Uh, totally, I would say, because of the fake injection, the people who gave us the fake injection, I totally blame them. We totally blame them. There has been one arrest in her mother's case. She's called for the suspect to be charged with murder. There's controversy in the UK after twice divorced Boris Johnson was allowed to get married in a Catholic cathedral. The British Prime Minister wed his fiancée Carrie Simons in a small ceremony on Saturday. But as the BBC's Vishala Sripathma reports, it's raised questions among Catholics. After photos of musicians leaving Downing Street emerged late last night, Number 10 confirmed this morning that the wedding had taken place. An image of the couple has been released, showing them posing in the gardens of Downing Street after the ceremony. The Prime Minister was baptised a Catholic, but was confirmed as an Anglican while at Eton College. Usually the Catholic faith does not allow divorcees to marry in church, and yet the Prime Minister, who has been divorced twice, was able to tie the knot at a cathedral in Westminster. According to some experts in canon law, previous weddings may, in some circumstances, be seen as invalid by the Catholic Church if the ceremonies were not Catholic. Neither of Mr Johnson's first two marriages took place in a Catholic church. Some in the church feel that not everyone will be happy. Father Mark Drew is an assistant priest at St Joseph's Church in Warrington. I myself have had to tell couples with great sadness that they couldn't remarry in church. And I think it does look to them, rightly or wrongly, as if the church is applying double standards. And I, I do fear that this decision, you know, does make the church look bad. I mean, goodness knows, we've suffered enough public relations disasters in recent years. During their courtship, Carrie Simons spoke about her faith on social media and their son, who was born last year, has been baptised as Catholic. The bride has taken the Prime Minister's surname and the couple will have their honeymoon next summer. Music has been proven to affect the brain more than any other stimulus and most of us have the ability to create personal playlists for whatever mood we're in. But could this be used in a medicinal way? Experts are looking into specific playlists designed based on where you are emotionally now and where you want to get to. The BBC's Jen Copstake explains. We've seen how artificial intelligence is being used to compose music from heavy metal algorithms and competitions like the AI Eurovision Song Contest. The way we consume music is also guided by algorithms. Spotify suggests artists and playlists based on our listening patterns. But could this data be used in an even more medicinal way? Companies are exploring ways to use all of this data to create what they're calling prescription playlists, which they hope could one day replace some painkillers or even anti-anxiety medication. The Warren Youth Project in Hull provides mental health support to young people between the ages of 16 and 25. Before the pandemic, it was already using music as therapy. You'll hear people talk about miracle drugs like penicillin, the breakthroughs down through the years, but in actual fact, music is the miracle drug we've always had. A project called Three Minute Heroes teamed young people up with local bands to make music videos based on their lyrics. We had hurdles, but we had them representing emotional hurdles, things like anxiety and depression, stress, loneliness. And over the course of the video, um, our singer Rory overcomes those hurdles. Is it something that you see in young people in Hull? Or? It's definitely something that we see in young people at Hull, and especially at the pandemic, it's, you know, it's multiplied several times. It can be isolation, it can be drug and alcohol abuse, um, it can lead to problems with education and employment. Jake is the first young person at the Warren to trial Medi Music, an algorithm designed to pick the perfect playlist of songs to lower your heart rate. Music is academically proven to affect the brain more than any other stimulus. 
It's already been trialed with dementia patients in the Lancashire Teaching Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust with a reported decrease in heart rate of 22%. A trial is currently underway with 40 NHS doctors and nurses at the same trust who are working in critical care during the pandemic. And can you talk us through those devices in front of you? Yeah, sure. So what we've decided to do is build our own device. This is what we're looking to move towards. It's been designed to just focus on the delivery of music with no distractions you would normally get when looking at a smartphone. And then on the bottom of that, there are there'll be additional modules that are measure heart rate variability, which is a good indicator of stress, and hopefully, ultimately, uh, something that will measure cortisol via a wearable. For Jake's playlist, only six songs were chosen, but the algorithm can handle up to 400. The music chosen is not necessarily what you'd imagine. Like, because it doesn't sound very relaxing. Like, punch the clock. No, well, that's what I thought. <laughs> so I thought albums, it doesn't seem yeah. like relaxing music. When I went away and listened to the playlist, I think I definitely was calm. I was definitely very engrossed while listening to it. It's a really easily accessible um, piece of kit. It has potential to just help as an additional tool to alleviate those pressures and those concerns that young people have around their mental health well-being. And for us, it's you know imperative that we try and deal with these emerging issues as quickly as we can using any methodology or opportunity that we can get our hands on. There is very little doubt the effect music has on us and its ability to capture the mind. A Spanish charity called Music to Awaken uploaded a video tribute to former prima ballerina Marta Gonzalez. She was suffering with dementia and suddenly hears the swan theme from Swan Lake. Further trials of its use are needed, but MediMusic estimates its algorithm, as well as reawakening imaginations, could cut the costs of some medicines by a quarter. Well, just to update you on the situation with Canterbury and flooding and roads there, Waka Kotahi has updated the situation. There's still about seven um, main roads that are closed, and Waka Kotahi is aiming to open State Highway 1 south of Christchurch through Dunsandall and also at Hines, south of Ashburton, on Tuesday, possibly in the afternoon. Uh, the Transport Agency says there's still up to 500 mils of water over the highway at the Selwyn River. Waikirikiri Bridge, but by Tuesday, crews should be ready to clear debris and reopen the highway. Now, they're saying Canterbury residents can text the name of most local rivers, for example, Rakaia, Ashburton, Hines. You've got to do it in capital letters, and you send the name of the river to 37. Three O. I'll say that again. You text it to three seven three O. The river needs to be in capital letters. But what you will get back is official flood updates, including evacuation notices from Environment Canterbury and um, vital information relating to your area. So text the name of the river in capitals, 3730, and you'll get useful information back. Now, on the Harbour Bridge, boy, has it got you people texting us at the rate of knots. This person says, how about charging cyclists 15 bucks a crossing? OK. Um, another person says, well, Rosie's got in touch to say the arrogance and selfishness and entitlement of Chris Darby and his selfish cycling mates. Millions of dollars have been spent on cycling already. There are more important needs, says Rosie. But this other person says, open up a trial lane for bikes for a month. Count the usage. If they beat the number of people travelling by car per any of the other lanes, keep it. Otherwise, scrap it. And the cyclists will have nothing more to say. Ditto for buses. That would make sense, they say. See you tomorrow. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. Ashburton's mayor is predicting the cost of the flood cleanup could stretch into tens of millions of dollars as the rain eases and river levels subside. A Heinz family is settling in for a second night at a welfare centre as the town remains completely surrounded by floodwaters that have also closed State Highway 1. And State Highway 1 is still closed with no detours at Greta Valley in North Canterbury after a crash. And National MP Nick Smith will leave politics after more than 30 years.